it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm sorry I can't be with you. I, I was at another conference in D.C. the last few days, including today. Um, and um, I also apologize that my my presentation is not entirely on topic. Um, it, I'm presenting on Russia, but not so much on the industrial policy, although what I am talking about will connect to that in some places, as you'll see. Um, my presentation is about uh, authoritarian soft power, as I've called it, which I'll explain what I'm getting at with this, but the idea of the types of use of um, cyber tools in combination with information manipulation that we've seen developing as a Russian strategy recently and how that relates to um, cyber security and cyber strategy domestically. Um, uh, and I'll try to pull out that theme a bit more as I go through. So uh, what you see here is an uh, image from the 2011-2012 Russian mass protest march um, in which uh, it, you had the largest protest since the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, in Russia. And it was a protest which clearly leveraged new information technology tools and the internet and social media. Uh, and it's a very important turning point for Russia for state relations with uh, the tech sector in this space. Um, so going back to this period leading up to the 2011-2012 moment, um, in the West, there was a lot of discussion about um, the potentially, oh, sorry, next slide. Um, did it on mine and forgot to say. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the potential um, repercussions of um, information technologies and the internet and social media tools in less democratic settings as a tool of um, democratization, liberalization, reform, invigorating civil society, protest movements and the like. There's a center still at Stanford called the Center for the Study of Liberation Technologies. Um, this was very much the discourse at the time and you had um, things like the, the mapping of the blogosphere uh, by the Berkman Center in Russia uh, that showed that there was already a, a vibrant public affairs uh, segment in the Russian blogosphere in the 2010-2011 time frame. You had uh, people pointing to these uh, uses of tools like uh, the Ushahadi crowd mapping platform used by the NGO Golos in Russia during the 2011-2012 election cycle to allow people to uh, map electoral violations in their precincts. Uh, and so these sorts of things were being pointed to as really popular positive uh, developments. And um, at the same time, next slide, at the same time, uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, the U.S. State Department presence was really pushing an agenda of internet freedom and norms of internet freedom, naming and shaming states that were seen as violating these norms. Um, you see this in Hillary Clinton's museum speech in 2010. And um, an interesting thing to note about this this speech and the sort of doctrinal position that it it uh, represents at the time and conceptual attitude uh, coming from the U.S. and Western democracies was one. Uh, next slide was one which interwrapped the idea of internet freedom and the idea of national cybersecurity. These were seen as not conflicting. And so glo the global internet freedom agenda uh, pushed for uh, thinking of the internet as a, and in particular the World Wide Web, the content layer of the internet, social media as uh, online media. These were te uh, technologies of connection, they were technologies of a uh, global public sphere uh, where you didn't really need to think much about security issues and uh, this was a very distinct thing from the issue of national cybersecurity. Her museum speech was a really great representation of this. In the same speech, there's a discussion of an attack on one nation's network is an attack on all. And at the same time, the idea that uh, countries that are censoring the internet are violating this democratic norm of internet freedom and should be uh, made to recognize this norm and sort of uh, shamed for what they're doing. And uh, insofar as there is a governance uh, necessity for the global internet, it's a multi-stakeholder process. It's not so much about national interest and state sovereignty. Next slide. Um, and of course, the discourse coming from the West has shifted dramatically in the last year. Um, and as we all are aware, with the DNC hack, with the discussion of information warfare, um, bots, trolls, fake news, and the like, and um, it's 
studying what I've been coming from studying, which was um, for my dissertation, I worked on looking at the evolution of authoritarian uh, regime and hybrid regime internet controls. Um, it's striking the change in discourse coming from the U.S. and uh, allied uh, democracies because uh, this conceptual shift really is is striking. The integration of discussion of content into uh, security discussion. Um, so next slide. Um, in the remainder of this talk, I'll walk through a few things which uh, lay out uh, how this is significant, what's going on with Russia, with the way we're thinking about this, and uh, um, if you, is it showing all the red things? Yeah, I see it is. Um, how um, we think about this, um, what it is that's going on, why in this case it's both part of, it comes out of both the national security attitudes coming from Russia and the thinking about cybersecurity and also uh, thinking about media and military doctrine. And what the repercussions of this are, how it's a challenge to our way of thinking as Western democracies about the division between cybersecurity and internet content and media and what possible solutions or possible not very good solutions have been proposed and some dilemmas that come out of that. Um, I'm hopeful that, though this isn't very much about Russian industrial policy at the moment, it's helpful for the other conversations that have been going on during the day. Um, so to start out, next slide, um, if you look at Russian uh, use of cyber tools in information warfare as it's been developing in recent years, it, it's two things very distinctly, very clearly, and things which we're not used to until recently thinking about in the same paragraph. One is things which are the classic sort of definition of cyber attacks and hacking, uh, ranging from DDoS attacks to shut down uh, affiliate, to shut down groups that happened to the NGO Golos with the crowd mapping platform on election day, things like site defacement or hacking into secure networks, uh, changing data, stealing data, um, but then it's the combination of that with uh, use and control of manipulation in inter internet and media content. Um, things like doxing, use of the stolen data not for espionage but uh, to manipulate the narrative in another country or, uh, or uh, and, and also um, manipulate media at home and uh, a lot of this, as I'll come to in a second, comes out of how you've seen developments in the Russian media space and Russian control over their own uh, internet segment and media um, in recent years. So, um, next slide. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with some of these examples. Uh, it's there are a number of examples in recent years besides the DMC hack and the things that have been in the news the last year. Um, the attack uh, on Estonia's internet in 2007, uh, on Georgia in 2008, uh, concurrently with shooting war, and the various tools used in Ukraine uh, since 2014, ranging from critical infrastructure attacks to targeted surveillance to uh, use of information manipulation campaigns. And all of these being used in sync. What all of these have in common is the sort of hybridity of the actions, the use of plausible deniability or uh, use of things which are not immediately attributable in combination with other sorts of actions. Uh, and it, it implies a sort of unified thinking about uh, some of these tactics in a larger strategic space. Um, next slide. So in terms of things that these types of actions have in common, it's first of all, the way that this is being used, it's not just a uh, technical tool or just a wartime tool. It's something that's used at home and abroad, in peace and in war, and intentionally blurries the boundaries of these things. Um, and it's technical and informational. It's about content and uh, technical hacking tools and uh, sec network security. Um, it's also about influencing perception and reasoning, not about uh, always hard coercion. and. Um, use of ambiguity, illusion, manipulating emotions and cognitive frames and narratives is key to this. Uh, and it's part of a broader strategy. One example, it's used to uh, muddy the waters of attribution and of certainty about what's going on in order to lead to doubt and delay. And meanwhile, facts on the ground can change. And it can lead to defeat in certain ways of more powerful opponents. Um, next slide. So where does this come from? Well, um, 
the first thing to think about is um, that this isn't just a military strategy. This is also an informational strategy. And so there are at least two antecedents to think about in terms of how this approach has been developing in Russia. And um, I think the part that is that relates the most closely in some ways to the discussion in this conference is the discussion of how this comes out of domestic controls of information and security and the internet. And um, this ties into the idea of thinking about information security as a part of national security and concern over things like the white ribbon protest movement I showed in the opening slide and the Arab Spring and uh, color revolutions and stability threats. Um, it also comes out of military doctrine and strategic thought going back to the Cold War era and even before um, and also thinking about things like perestroika and the color revolutions and how the U.S. has used soft power and trying to mirror image that in some ways. Um, and so uh, Next slide. Uh, to start out with the, the domestic uh, origins, I think it's something that gets left out of this discussion a lot. And it's, it's important to understand that uh, a lot of what has been going on in terms of the experimentation in this space in Russia has been going on for a long time domestically in terms of how to maintain control and order. And um, you see this in the evolution of domestic media controls during the 2000s and 2010s. Um, in the period leading up to the and before the 2011-2012 protest, um, there was a, a long period of slow incremental um, uh, crackdown on the domestic media space in Russia. But it was a, a sort of odd time because in some ways uh, there was restriction and in other ways it was very asymmetric. The internet was left largely untouched. There wasn't the kind of censorship that there was in a lot of countries of similar regime type during the same period. And uh, up until uh, shortly before the, the mass protest movement and the dramatic set of changes since 2012, uh, during the Medvedev presidency, there had been extremely strong support for the ICT sector, at least verbally, touring of Silicon Valley, talking about encouragement of economic modernization, focusing on the tech sector. And yet during the 2000s, leading up to the Medvedev presidency, uh, there had been a long period of incremental dissembling of independent or disassembling of the independent media that had developed during the 90s. Uh, and um, the first step in this, uh, in some ways, was the development of the information security doctrine in 2000, which was adopted uh, very soon after the sinking of the Kursk submarine, uh, which uh, was an event in August of 2000 in which um, Norway offered to help uh, this um, submarine uh, full of soldiers that were out uh, um, on a test exercise sunk. There was a, there was a malfunction. And um, uh, Putin, who was new to the presidency, said they didn't need help. They would rescue their own sailors. But by the time the uh, Russian uh, ships got there, everyone had drowned and uh, or, or died. And um, it, the footage on the news at the time made uh, then president looked very bad because he was on vacation and shown on vacation while this was going on. And it uh, was the beginning of the sort of war with the oligarchs who owned the major television stations in order to take control over their way of putting out the narrative. And through the 2000s, the crackdown continued on uh, independent uh, television media and then print media. And yet the internet throughout this period re retained an element of vibrancy and um, people would talk about it as the last place you could have like a truly independent media outlet. And, um, and you, so it, it was an interesting time to uh, study the Russian internet and it was sort of an odd um, example, the level of asymmetry. Next slide, please. Um, because during the same, uh, next slide. Uh, during the same period, uh, you could see uh, you could see you could see a lot of pages like this when you were trying to um, 
can get to things like a political science professor's blog from places like Qatar. Um, you know, I, I, I loved this one personally when I was trying to access one of my professor's blogs, but um, yeah, because it was hilarious, if you're going to tell me that this material is uh, some, somehow prohibited, at least to see this little guy. But um, these sorts of overt block pages were becoming something of a norm in a lot of authoritarian or, or hybrid regime states at the time. Um, next slide. Uh, however, as you can see in this slide, with data from the 2010-2011 period from the Open Net Initiative, from Citizen Lab, and from uh, Freedom House's Freedom in the World scores um, that show the, on the x-axis, shows the restriction level of civil liberties uh, overall. Um, the level of internet censorship or filtering was far from uniform among states of similar regime type. And what you see here is that countries that fall well below the line here of uh, sort of one-to-one -one relationship between uh, having high filtering and high restrictions of other sorts of civil liberties, the um, countries that are asymmetric in this time period, including Russia and many of the countries of the former Soviet region, uh, had far less restriction or censorship, very little censorship of the internet compared to what the, was practiced in terms of the overall control of the media and overall control of civil liberties like associate freedom of association. Next slide. And um, this was this raised interesting questions about what was going to happen going forward, because clearly some of these countries faced uh, what appeared to be a dichotomous decision of what path to follow, and um, they faced a number of trade-offs involving the economic. Uh, problems that they could create by cracking down on the tech sector and on uh, the internet, uh, and also in terms of the legitimacy prices that they could pay at home and abroad. Um, this graph shows the same internet filtering levels compared to internet penetration in, in the same period. And what you see here, uh, the color coding is, uh, it's a sort of rough heuristic of regime type at the time, uh, which was uh, Freedom House's uh, freedom in the world, not free, partly free, or free uh, ratings. And um, what you see was um, what appeared to be an emerging trend of convergence uh, among democracies towards a norm of as internet penetration grew and it became more visible and more important in the society, converging to this norm that was being promoted of internet freedom and not censoring uh, political and uh, sort of social commentary types of discourse and independent media on the internet. And um, yet among authoritarian regimes, it appeared that uh, there was more of a convergence towards censorship. Now, this is snapshot data. It's not longitudinal, so it doesn't show for sure that that was going to be a trend that was followed. But um, it, it raised questions about the countries that at this point had relatively low um, internet uh, penetration rates, uh, under about 40%. And most of the countries which were hybrid regimes or had been hybrid regimes in the 2000s with elements of democracy and authoritarianism uh, were in that range at the time, uh, including Russia. It had just been flipped, I think, in terms of its coding this year. But um, And it raised questions about what these countries would do, because they were countries that based their legitimacy in part on having democratic institutions and following democratic norms, even though they did so very imperfectly. And they would potentially face uh, high legitimacy legitimacy price at home and abroad if they were seen as flagrantly violating these norms by adopting a sort of great firewall approach and overtly censoring the internet uh, uh, a great deal. And yet, on the other hand, they were the ones that were the most vulnerable to these sorts of mass protests because they, uh, insofar as they were seen as hypocritical by their citizens for having elections, but the elections were rigged and things like this. And in fact, uh, falsified elections were a trigger moment frequently for these sorts of mass protests. And so it really raised the question what was going to happen in these countries going forward and how they were going to square that circle and balance conflicting forces. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and so um, what you saw actually happen was a sort of third path emerge, which wasn't following either trend exactly. While certainly the restriction levels over the internet and over tech companies and uh, citizens' use of online uh, media and social media changed dramatically in some cases in countries like Russia and also places like Turkey. Um, at the same time, you had the development of new approaches. And Russia, as well as some other countries in the former Soviet Union, uh, led the way in really pioneering some of these 
techniques that uh, folks at Citizen Lab have sometimes referred to these by generation, the first generation, next generation. The first generation being the things we think of as the sort of high watermark of censorship in the 2000s, a la a great firewall sort of approach, site blocking, keyword filtering, manual content censorship, sometimes even more draconian things like creation of an intranet or really limiting the amount of internet access uh, folks have. Um, but then the, these next generation approaches were often le using legal rules and uh, that were justified as um, anti-terrorism or things like this, anti-extremism, um, using informal takedown requirements behind the scenes for some one-off things, um, using just-in-time blocking by DDoS just at a, a, the critical moment and it looked like a technical failure. Uh, both targeted and um, mass surveillance used and then uh, used to dox particular individuals to spread uh, information about them online, things of this sort. And, all, and what these had in common was uh, many of them were either in keeping somewhat with the trappings of democratic procedure or they were uh, plausibly deniable, hard to attribute, uh, less overt. Next slide. And um, so while you had these sorts of uh, policy shifts and the creation of a block list in Russia during this period, um, you also had this development of what was in some ways really a, a different approach. Um, next slide. And um, so during this period, definitely, there was a... a Increasing ratcheting up of pressure on the tech sector. Uh, Pavel Durov, who was the founder, founder of Vokontaktia, Russia's equivalent of Facebook, uh, left the country saying that he had been pressured to sell his shares in the company and that he was never going to uh, start another company in Russia because he had um, re refused to take down group pages that were in support of Ukraine. Um, you had uh, the chain, the conversion of RIA Novosti, the uh, news station at the time, uh, uh, the major news agency in Russia that had had some degree of independence, into uh, Rossiya Savonia, uh, Russia Today, that was led by one of the main sort of aggressive sort of pro-Kremlin uh, talking heads. You had... Um, a lot of pressure on companies like Yandex and other tech, uh, major tech companies within Russia during this period. And at the same time, you had the creation of all sorts of new channels of creation of content uh, through bots, trolls, viral propaganda videos, things like this. And so uh, at the same time as you had this panoply of new laws that allowed certain legitimate uh, supposed forms of content censorship. Uh, next slide. Um, but this was very different in approach, nonetheless, from the approaches that had been the most extreme that we had seen in the 2000s and uh, the sort of great firewall type of model that relied on a more of a hermetic seal on information. Instead, this was an approach that uh, was much more uh, about allowing a lot of information to flow, but also controlling the narrative. Uh, it had vestiges of democratic legitimacy, but it made an uh, effort to really uh, muddy the waters about uh, information or to present alternative framings through content uh, manipulation and content production as much as through content blocking. And it came with an alternative set of concepts and of uh, institutions. Um, and um, this included things like alternative uh, sort of legal frameworks that have been emulated by other countries in the former Soviet region. And um, it also included the information security sort of uh, doctrine for how to think about the relationship between information and cybersecurity and internet content. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the information security doctrine was certainly a key part of this, which brings me to how this related to also national security and military thinking during this period. So the information security doctrine clearly, uh, even in its first iteration, was concerned with things like the effect of perestroika on Soviet collapse, the things like the Arab Spring or the color revolutions, moments in which stability instability could amount to insecurity and uh, the effects of Western democracy promotion in that. Um, and um, this doctrine has been promoted by Russia in various uh, forums internationally in one form or another in combination with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization allies and, and China, like at the UN promoting the uh, uh, information non-aggression code of conduct. Um, next slide. Um, now, the other 
antecedent of this way of approaching uh, information content and its manipulation uh, comes from military doctrine and strategy, although these two are I would argue intimately in many ways interrelated. So again, uh, even though there are Cold War antecedents, like the idea of Maskarovka, of using deception and psychological manipulation to influence the decision-making capacities and decision-making processes of opponents, uh, like the parading of fake missiles in order to try to encourage thinking that the Soviet Union had more missiles than it in fact did, um, at the same time you have uh, a real updating of this to concern about the current global order of globalization and globalized information flows and an awareness of the way the West has largely thought about non-democratic states as hermetically sealed, as relying on that control of the information within and a blocking of information and the idea that uh, public diplomacy programs, Radio Free Europe, Radio Moscow, these kinds of things could be used to puncture that uh, that seal, and in so doing, actually lead to cascades of information and realization that people have been lied to, and things like this, and really destabilize regimes. And the the effect of this approach is how how do you both turn that around, and also how do you remain resilient to that? Uh, next slide. And uh, in the 2010s, there have been a number of updated approaches to military doctrine. One of the most famous that's been a lot discussed in recent years in discussion of Russian uh, aggression of the hybrid war sort of type is that um, he argues in a 2013 uh, paper and then more recently uh, about the use and exploitation of information spaces. The argument is explicitly framed about what to do uh, to protect oneself from things like the Arab Spring and what was seen as the potential role of the U.S. and adversaries in promoting those sorts of events in Russia. And um, use of the cognitive and psychological uh, influence on the perceptions of adversaries to in, in order to compel actions or to get them to not use force or uh, be able to win uh, a confrontation without use of hard coercion. Uh, and you see updated versions of this strategic thought coming out uh, day by day. Uh, next slide. So all of this raises a few questions, and I'll try to tie this in a little bit to uh, the, the overarching theme of the discussion here. Um, next slide. First of all, uh, I, I framed this as authoritarian soft power and in terms of the challenges of this kind of approach globally because I think it's probably relevant for thinking about uh, the cyber approach to cybersecurity in democratic states. Uh, and um, one of the things that's going on in these sorts of operations uh, is an effort to influence not just uh, domestic politics, not just international politics, but both, uh, both the international sort of liberal order and the domestic politics of democracies, in part by exploiting the features as weaknesses. And um, some of these features include, uh, next slide, um, so some of these features include things like the fact that uh, advanced Western democracies are very reliant on information technology uh, and information systems, but they also include things like that elections are sacrosanct, that this is extremely important to legitimacy in democracies, or the idea that uh, internet freedom has been a norm, and we uh, have talked, we've promoted internet freedom and not censoring social media and internet content and online media. And um, the idea that um, this can be manipulated uh, in order to sow uh, discord and, cre and uh, division. And um, internationally, the same kind of use of, of the things which are clear lines as weaknesses, because, uh, you know, if, if it matters a lot what qualifies as an act of war, then by doing things that are hard to attribute or don't quite qualify, but allow for significant changes in the playing field, uh, you can also sow division between allies, you can bring into question the, the old rules of the game. Uh, next slide. So I, I apologize, this slide's slightly redundant with the previous one, so I'll skip to the second part, which is uh, the question of possible solutions. And uh, this has been coming up a lot recently. Anyone who's been working in cybersecurity in the U.S. or in uh, discussion of Internet policy in the U.S., uh, these questions have been significant in the last year. 
what do we do in response to this kind of thing? Uh, do we think in terms of deterrence theory, deterrence by punishment? Do we do mirror imaging of the same kind of thing back? Um, do we uh, use denial strategies, uh, building resilience, strength? Do we make people more media literate so they can tell what is a, a propaganda story versus actual news media? Um, and um, this all raises some really challenging questions for uh, how democracies should deal in this space in terms of relations with their own tech companies and social media companies, for example. Um, and next slide. Um, and of course, it raises questions about how we think about this in terms of uh, solving these problems in ways that are in keeping with uh, democratic values. And um, I've myself recently been doing a lot about, of thinking about this in the context of uh, social media and internet content. Of course, this also raises questions about how to deal with the, the harder uh, cybersecurity questions uh, on a technical level. But uh, in terms of the issues around uh, governance of the content layer, uh, this raises new challenges because it challenges that old division of the uh, that I discussed before, of the Hillary Clinton speech in 2010, the idea that you can have internet freedom, a global information commons on the one hand, and on the other hand, you can have a uh, concern of national cybersecurity. And of course, there are some things you can have that discussion division about still, critical infrastructure protection versus global social media companies. But more and more, the discussion, the discourse in Western democracies has tended to mirror image the old uh, Russian thinking about information security as we start to discuss, well, how, are there some lines about freedom of expression we need to change? Are there some issues we need, like things that are fake stories, things that are extremists that we need to uh, deal with in a different way, tweak algorithms? And there's been a lot of pressure on the tech sector companies to, to respond to this. And so uh, bringing it back to Russia, I think it's important as, as Western countries move forward thinking about this to think about how that has played out for Russian tech companies. And um, I think that um, the inability to divide the information space from the security issues has made life very challenging for tech companies in Russia and other countries of the former Soviet Union, one. And two, uh, thinking in this way makes it very difficult to, to imagine a global set of solutions for content governance, uh, which is especially important when dealing with uh, a country like the U.S. where our tech companies are so global in scope. Um, so next slide. So I'll end there, and I'm happy to, in any discussion that follows this, I tie this in more with specific issues about uh, the tech sector in Russia and the, the pressures that have been put on companies there. Uh, thanks. Okay, um, so one of the things that we haven't discussed uh, a great deal in the other papers, uh, but perhaps we might consider, is the role of the media. You, you brought up various different kind of acquisition strategies used by the government to kind of silence dissent. Um, and so as the paper moves forward, I think that's something that um, will, be, will be interesting for you to look at and also is maybe a little bit different than the rest of the papers uh, that we have as well. I mean, one of the obvious advantages of having uh, the Russian case in, in the wheelhouse is obviously that it offers us a, a take from an authoritarian regime or a potential non-democracy rather than uh, most of the, the other cases that, that we're looking at. Um, so I, I think there's something fairly, fairly interesting there uh, for us to kind of tease out. And you, you definitely led us with a really nice click, cliffhanger at the, at the end there about um, the, the challenges faced by Russian tech firms or tech firms in the former Soviet Union. Uh, and I think what we'll probably end up finding is that there's pretty significant differences between the challenges faced by tech companies in Russia versus those in, say, the United States or the United Kingdom uh, that are going to be worth teasing out. Um, obviously, Kaspersky Labs is one of the companies that, that I happen to know quite well, and I think there's, there's some pretty significant challenges for Kaspersky as you try to operate globally uh, from a Russian base of operations without potentially, um, I mean, from what I've heard, the Kaspersky Labs staff don't tend to particularly agree with the, the, the country with which they are, are affiliated. Um, and so. Uh, it's, it's definitely a hard square for them to circle. Um, so I think, again, you've, you've got some really interesting kind of nuggets here as, as the paper moves forward. Um, and 
uh, we look forward to, to looking at the final final manuscripts in a, in a couple months here. Um, so yeah. Jackie, do you want to say something about Kapersky Labs and the private sector a little bit of, you, informally? Sure. Um, now, I hesitate to say too much because a lot of this has happened and blown up in the last few weeks while I've been traveling and at conferences. So some of you in the room might be more up on some of the details of what's happened in the last few weeks than I am. But I, I, I'm fascinated by this and I, I plan to dig into it in depth. Um, the thing I would say about it right now is... Um, while I've followed this story developing, I've tried to avoid jumping on the immediate bandwagon of the sort of reflexive reaction that's been going on in the media about it, because from what I knew about Kaspersky Labs um, prior to this, um, I didn't have the sense that it was automatically the case that they would be involved in this sort of thing. And even some conversations I've had in the last week have again sort of raised the questions of, you know, how much... Is it sure that they are that this was a top level decision? Uh, how much involvement by whom? And um, I think that it raises interesting, if alarming, questions about what can be going on uh, inside one tech company or exploiting the uh, the software of one tech company without necessarily all actors involved knowing that's happening. And I, I, I'm not saying that that's the case, but I think that it, it raises some interesting questions. Kaspersky Labs has had an excellent reputation for a long time, obviously, in uh, both in the security community and in the Russian tech sector. Uh, they were one of the sources of pride of a company that was quite successful. And um, I, so, I did field research for my dissertation a few years ago in 2013, 2014. At the time, I wasn't as focused on cybersecurity as I am uh, now. I was focused more on internet content control and regulation. And um, But I wanted to understand the economic repercussions of the changes that were happening. And so I talked to as many people in the tech sector as I could. Um, and I, I never actually uh, met people from Kaspersky and interviewed them. So I can't speak to that based on personal experience. But in that community, they had an excellent reputation. And this community included a lot of people who, as Andrew said, did not share all the views of their uh, of the country in which they were located. I had people tell me that they had uh, that they were trying to broaden their strategy in order to develop platforms for other countries so that they wouldn't lose all, you know, so that they, even if things, the lights went out on their company in Russia, they would be able to move elsewhere. Even companies that were internet content based and were based around building a loyal user base within a particular geography. I had people uh, talk about the frustration of dealing with the government and um, government representatives and trying to explain to them how the algorithmic nature of their of their technology didn't allow them to handpick which things got chosen by different algorithms and as a result they could not um, do what the government wanted and yeah, so there was a lot of tension about the pressures and leaning that was happening. And um, I, I would guess, if I had to, that the story with Kaspersky is not a one-sided story, that there is some complexity to it. That's not saying what that complexity is. Um, but I, I wouldn't necessarily assume that it's uh, the first thing, that the first set of stories that come out is the full story. and. Uh, but it is representative of the kind of tensions with the government in uh, Russia in the last few years for tech companies of all sorts, uh, that there is a heavy pressure on companies, and it's a game. And uh, some companies are more willing than others to comply with aspects of that pressure. Um, and I can't speak for sure to the leadership of Kaspersky on what the whole story is with that and has been with that, but uh, from stories I did hear with people I interviewed, it clearly was a source of some duress for many employees in the tech sector. So I'm going to be talking on about the rise of China as a cyber industrial power. And in many ways, it flows quite well um, from what Becky's done uh, in her presentation, because uh, China, like Russia, is an authoritarian state, and cyber security is a very, very important tool um, in terms of how it projects power and it's like, um, and it, in terms of a source of, of control. 
And so as a way of setting the stage, um, China and the Chinese cyber security industry has been growing very rapidly over the last two decades. But one of the big complaints that um, the Chinese leaders have um, is that um, it's a very big industry, but it's not very strong. Um, so while there's hundreds of cyber security um, firms today, if not thousands, and the country is a, a hotbed for uh, of cyber um, ad, ad activities, both legitimate and malicious, it's, um, it, there's very few um, recognized um, Chinese cyber security companies. There's certainly nothing like Kaspersky that, that, that we've just heard, heard, heard from. And what, has, what this has done is that um, the Chinese leadership, especially under Xi Jinping, who's been in power for the last five years, has sort of focused in the last couple of years of how to turn China from being just a big power to becoming a strong cybersecurity power. And it's declared in, so like in some of the strategies and, 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 and doctrines in the last year or two that the building of a strong nation is an urgent priority um, for the state. And so in my paper, I try to address a number of key questions about this effort to build a strong cyber, secu um, cyber security um, and capability, in particular focusing on in terms of industrial policies. So the, the key questions that I address is issues such as what are the key political, economic, security, and strategic drive, drive drivers behind this um, cyber security industrial policy making itself. What kind of strong cyber security industry does the Chinese authorities, in particular the Chinese leadership, want? What are the principles, the guidance, and implementation mechanisms applied in this development and transformation of the cyber security industry? And also then, what are the key actors? What are the key co 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 coalition? And how is this Chinese cyber security industrial ecosystem um, organized and, um, and evolving going forwards. Um, and sort of a, much like um, Jackie's paper, I mean, I try to, from a, like a conceptual and theoretical perspective, which is, uh, which is in the paper, which I don't, like, um, I won't talk too much about, but it's like, um, I see, I try to frame it through the prism of a technical security state, which is what China very much is today where um, the relationship between security and technology is a very important, it's like an organizing uh, approach. And, and, and techno security states, whether it's China or it's Russia, their focus is prioritizing national security, whether it's externally or internally de derived, and using the development of domestically sourced te technological and industrial innovation capabilities to support this effort to um, to, um, to um, manage their security. So in, in, in my paper itself, um, I go through um, and list and discuss um, a number of key cybersecurity development strategies and plans. So, I mean, um, China um, is, as an authoritarian state, also as a techno-nationalist state, it tends to take a state-led, top-down approach in terms of the development of its technological and industrial capabilities. And it's very, this is very much the case within the, the, within the cybersphere itself. And so what, what we've seen, and especially under Xi Jinping, that there's been this effort uh, over the last couple of years to lay out a, both a near, medium, and long-term vision and the implementation strategy about how to build this strong cyber security and power. So what, what, what we see that's been drafted and implemented in the last couple of years is like a 10 to 20 year informationization development strategy, um, long-term industrial policies focusing on issues such as like um, um, next generation internet capabilities, information security um, capabilities, and developing also the hardware um, for um, developing cyber-related um, capabilities, such as computers, especially high-performance computers, microprocessors, and, and all the ha hardware that like, um, provides um, the, the, the basis for, for China's cyber might. And 
with, with all these like um, development strategies, um, both technology and cyber itself, um, Xi Jinping has very much um, provided a grand strategic vision over these past couple of years, where the key principle that um, he advocates and which um, and which China has really been pushing um, within the international community is that um, it's like um, the cyber security or the, or the cyberspace should be considered to be a safe, stable, and prosperous online space. So that it shouldn't be a power struggle amongst countries. So and so what what, what this means for China is that uh, cyber security shouldn't be considered to be a global um, comment, but it's very much divided into so cyber sovereignty, that China has its sovereignty, other countries have their own sovereignty, and they should be left alone to, de to dictate and determine what, the, what they do. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that um, they can't um, interfere, it's just that other countries can't interfere in China's cyber s sovereignty. But China reserves the right to defend it, it, it itself, and um, and also as part of this key principle, um, and this is sort of the struggle for the norms of defining, so like um, the nature of the global cyber um, order going forwards, is um, China emphasizes that they they want a multilateral, democratic, um, and transparent pro pro process in which um, to define the, the cyber standards and the, and the cyber norm, it should be primarily left to states as opposed to allowing non-state actors, whether companies or associations, etc., which is sort of the model that, that sort of been advocated by the West. So this is the backdrop of, like, uh, of, the, of the approach that China now is using like, um, its like um, increasingly clear normative framework, and then um, 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 to impose its vision on the global order, and then bring up to speed its um, its domestic cyber industrial um, capabilities. And so, as we turn and look at the development of China's cyber security industry, so we can sort of like um, define it into three distinct stages. In as I mentioned at, at, at the outset, um, China's um, development of its cyber security capabilities has been relatively short, sort of only within the last two decades. The first um, stage took, 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 took place from the late 1990s to the early 2000s, because the, um, the internet only began to appear in China sort of from the mid 1990s. And in this first stage, um, these sort of uh, so there's five to eight years. Um, um, it was sort of a fairly um, it's like um, chaotic, free for all um, development of the um, of the Chinese domestic cyber security um, in industry. It, at that, at that, in those early periods, the the authorities didn't really think that the internet and the cyber space was, was that important a priority so, so it was sort of left to um, to the private sector um, to um, startup firms to really um, like um, try to gain dominance over over the marketplace and it was um, and so there was very little re regulation and oversight when the authorities began to become to appreciate and uh, prioritize the importance of cyber security uh, more. Um, so, and I know that I'm, I'm completely um, for, for from that you've been looking at the slides. I think I'm on slide 12 right, right now. So, um, in in the second stage, um, between the mid 2000s and the early 2010s, this was when the authorities began to um, impose a much more engaged and interventionist, an interventionist role. They began to, um, to like, um, um, like um, put forward a cohesive strategy um, during this period between 2006 and, and 2020. They came up with a national informationization development strategy, where cyber security was an important part of a broader approach towards information security. And they tried to deal with a lot of the, a lot of the market failure. 
Indians that were um, as a real result of a, a, a laissez-faire free for a market, market exploitation in the first day. And they began to just, like call for a much more like orderly, um, multi-tiered um, approach to developing information security. And so what we began to see is the, the establishment of, of a two-tier um, cybersecurity apparatus where there was a small elite of around about, about uh, uh, 20 to, um, to 25 firms that accounted for the large proportion of the, industry, of the cyber industry's total revenue, revenue, while there were six or 700 other very small firms that competed for a much more smaller share. Um, I mean, one of the problems, though, of, like, uh, of, the, of the government's intervention in the cyber market was that um, um, there, was, there was a lot of competition, a lot of bureaucratic competition, because um, cyber was a very, relatively new area, and so a very lucrative area. So a lot of government agencies, from the military, from the party, from the state, who wanted to get a major share of, of control, both for economic and, and bureaucratic political reasons. And so this was the phenomenon that was known as the nine dragons controlling the water that looked at that, like this, this proliferation. But, um, so you had um, civilian um, ministries, um, security ministries, party ministries, and the most important um, part of the apparatus that began to dominate was the national security um, part of the apparatus. Because um, increasingly, uh, cyber security was very much seen to be a key part of, of China's focus on, on national security, both in terms of national security from a domestic sense of controlling um, so like, um, internal stability, um, internal information, and also externally in terms of dealing with like um, with um, cyber espionage and, um, and, and, and engaging so like, um, like, um, in cyber um, confrontations with other countries. Um, and um, what made it even more important were main major scandals like um, the, um, um, the Snowden revelations about how pervasive the US was in terms of, of the National Security Agency being involved in in cyber activity. And what this has meant is like, um, it made even more clear to the Chinese authorities that um, cyber, one of the cyber security apparatus in the industry should be driven by these national security concerns. So, um, and in the paper, so um, I think um, on slide 18, I do have a chart um, of, um, of, it's uh, an organization chart of the proliferation of, of of agencies and actors within the cyber security space. And, and, and there's sort of five different segments. There's the military, the Communist Party, um, the state, the national security, the science and technology, and the business community itself. Um, and it's, as I said, it's the military, the national security, and the party that's sort of the main actors. So, um, so in the paper, I talk a little bit more about so like um, the types of uh, engagement between the state and the corporate <laughs> cyber security sectors itself. Some some of it that sort of fits it fits, fits into the um, the the framework that, that Vinny and Andrew has done in their more theoretical paper. And I, and I won't go into that but, but you can see it in, in my paper. Now, I, I, I want to sort of finish then. I mean, one of the questions that was posed um, as we were writing our paper was uh, what's China's place and China's, um, it's like, um, the, the implications for China's engagement in cyber security with the international cyber security order. As I've alle alluded to, it's like, um, as China grows bigger and stronger and more influential in the cyber, in the global cyberspace, I think it wants to uh, have a, a, a central role in shaping um, the norms and the uh, and the nature of um, of the global cyber order. To the extent that they weren't able to do that in the uh, in the in the physical post uh, World War II 
global order, they want to make sure that they have a major say um, um, in, in determining the nature of the global and cyber order um, going forward itself. And also, um, they're also very keen to be able to export a lot of the, uh, of the cyber industrial um, capacity that they have in China and export it to other countries, especially in the developing world itself. Um, issues of, like, um, of monitoring and control and having the state uh, play a fairly intrusive um, and authoritarian role. That is something that um, um, we, we've seen them doing in a number of developing states already, and I think um, that is something that we will see a, a lot more. So both from, a, um, from an economic, as well as a security, as well as a governance, and um, a geostrategic perspective. Um, it's like, um, what is going on in China has significant implications. Um, and, um, and I'll end it there. Um, but uh, the, uh, very briefly for people here, I, I work at the Yale Law School China Center, uh, but I've just moved to Oakland and I'm based here and working remotely, uh, also focusing on um, Chinese internet policy, uh, for about 80% of my time, about 20% on general US-China relations, uh, so you know who you're listening to. Um, I thought the paper was very strong here uh, and certainly uh, makes a, a phenomenal outlay of the, uh, the various uh, plans and approaches and the sort of um, official Chinese rhetoric um, about national security, cybersecurity, and um, the objectives that the government has in China for developing uh, cybersecurity capabilities in the market and, and throughout society. Um, I think the, uh, the, the framing also of the sort of, uh, of, of the, you know, techno security state is a very helpful way to look at what's going on in China. I wanna throw out a couple of things that I think are challenges to the framework for um, perhaps this paper and, and perhaps challenges that um, uh, countries like China or Russia issue to the broader research uh, project here. And the, the most basic one is, you know, while there is an element that was very nicely outlined in the presentation of um, a cybersecurity market that was emerging, uh, but then increasingly uh, became subject to uh, intervention in China, I think that if you look at cybersecurity as a policy priority today uh, in China, um, it may be more of a story of um, cybersecurity as a national priority resulting in industrial policy rather than sort of industrial policy directed at a market in cybersecurity. I'm not sure if that distinction is, is going to is, is fully making sense in the way I'm presenting it, but um, what I mean to say is that in the in the way that the paper presents the plans and the priority put on uh, cybersecurity as an element of national security, it's sort of, um, it's broader than uh, simply developing organizations that will uh, be cybersecurity firms or will provide cybersecurity services or products. Um, the approach uses some of the other tools um, that are discussed in, in market intervention um, for the purpose of cybersecurity. So you have this sort of closing out of the market uh, to foreign uh, service providers unless they're willing to obey uh, quite onerous and, and perhaps impossible to obey rules regarding uh, government data access. Um, you have, you know, a sort of, on one hand, a, uh, you know, promotion of national champions um, and on the other hand, setting rules that do burden those national champions. Uh, so I want to go into a couple of things here where I think there, there is an interplay between the industry uh, sector, the public sector, and, and government tensions. So um, one of the things that uh, the government has said is that data, big data especially, is a strategic national resource. And this classifies it as something that must be protected as a, as a matter of national security. And you sort of, um, uh, Chinese writers have um, made arguments along the lines of uh, because you could you know, drill into big data, this is sort of Chinese consumer data, that things collected by social media companies and other things, 
Um, you could derive information about society that could be used against China in a real national security state versus state uh, uh, confrontation. And therefore, the big data, the sort of everyday consumer data, uh, is considered subject of national security uh, regulation. This is, it, it manages to be an umbrella um, that brings rather you know, separate things from other jurisdictions like personal data protection or privacy into the umbrella of national security. Um, and of course, with the, whenever we're talking about data privacy in China, it has the proviso that it's privacy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, anybody but the Chinese state. And there's uh, very strong requirements that uh, the government be provided access. Um, the, the reason there's a tension with industry is that uh, the strategic national resource that needs to be protected for national security purposes is also uh, seen as fuel for the potential uh, innovations in the artificial intelligence and machine learning area. Um, you know, it's a resource in, in needing to be protected and also something that can be used. Um, but it makes it a trade-off for companies trying to go out, which is another priority that the Chinese government has had uh, in these national champions that are both in cybersecurity and other services. Um, Alibaba's Ant Financial uh, affiliate is probably going to have some trouble concluding a, a transaction to, uh, to purchase MoneyGram in the United States. And there's, um, you know, this is a detriment to Alibaba's ability to, to go out and to satisfy that prong of industrial policy. Huawei and ZTE have had problems around the world in some places more problems than others. Um, you know, I think that what we're seeing, the skepticism about Kaspersky Labs, even if not totally justified by, uh, by the facts, and we don't know all of them yet, is going to be also focused on cybersecurity firms like Chihu 360 or others uh, who do eventually try to provide services abroad. Um, and it, it's, it only gets worse when you look at the, um, the concerns that governments in uh, the United States and Europe, for instance, have about Alibaba's uh, cloud services uh, or some of the other providers out there. So um, last couple of notes. I'm sort of rushing, so uh, because I don't want to. So I, 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 have to um, I, have my, I have to get off to, to, to the hospital right, right now. I, I apologize. No but problem. I'll be in touch with you by email to get the reports. OK. Very good. Yeah, I'll send you and, and, and be well. Okay. I have to no problem. Have my, uh, my hospital. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you okay, for joining Okay, bye-bye. Why don't you continue? Okay, well, I'll, I'll go through a couple more things at hopefully the slightly less frantic pace. Um, but I think there's, uh, there's a good possibility to look at the Chinese case. Um, the paper as it is uh, features and describes very well various plans, strategic plans that have been published uh, by the Chinese government and the party. Um, I think there's a research question in how do these plans get implemented or not? You know, are the results followed through and how do they develop when they're replaced? Um, recently we saw a really interesting uh, exchange um, as the, uh, the cybersecurity law that went into effect earlier this year uh, is being developed into a full regime. Um, there's going to be new processes for uh, certifying that certain products, information products, are uh, secure for use in critical information infrastructure applications. Um, before all of this came online, Microsoft had built a custom uh, Chinese government edition of Windows 10. Um, and they had sort of done this directly with authorities in the Chinese government and sort of government affiliated uh, you know, security examination organizations. But now there, were, there was a new set of rules that products would need to satisfy. So you had on one hand um, a real, uh, you know, a long time kind of cyber nationalist in the, in the sense of uh, developing indigenous technology, uh, arguing that this Windows uh, edition is no longer valid. It must be uh, banned from for acquisition by the, the government until it passes the second set of reviews. On the other hand, you had um, a, a very prominent uh, 
person in charge of one of these examination centers that works for the government to, uh, to do certifications and look at source code and ensure security. Um, and this person was arguing that, in contrast, uh, you know, this was a good faith effort by Microsoft to, uh, to meet China's needs, and it was uh, really something that should be acknowledged, and it just wasn't realistic to throw out all of this, uh, this sort of good faith um, cooperation. So the, we get to watch as the, the regulations are issued and supposedly implemented, uh, and then to see how the, the debates within the government uh, and, and among various offices uh, resolve themselves. Um, so there's, I got two more short notes. Um, one is to say that uh, when you have something like, you have people inside the Chinese government in policy making apparatus who are concerned with personal privacy and personal data protection. And this is what they work on. Um, to some extent, I think you can take the plans at their word when they say that personal data protection is connected to national security. But on the other hand, I sometimes read this as uh, you know, an indication that the people concerned with privacy have successfully connected themselves to the national security argument, uh, which is the thing that you need to hook yourself to if you want to move your initiative forward. Um, so, if you can use national security as a mobilizing tool within the bureaucracy, um, you can get a lot more done. And I think that it's going to be important in the long term when looking at uh, the industrial policies that promote certain approach, approaches and you know, uh, push out other providers. Um, there are different priorities that people are linking to the, to the bigger ship that's moving forward. Um, I think there's a way to test uh, looking into the future whether this stuff is really about um, national security or really about protectionism and national champions. And that is, as the Chinese cybersecurity law regime it has many different standards, uh, regulations, uh, uh, measures that are attached to it, many of them in draft form now, as this regime fills in and becomes more fully developed and is implemented, um, Will there be an emergence of uh, a solution like Privacy Shield between China and other markets, be it EU, um, United States, or others, um, where international companies are given the opportunity to compete in China on even ground with, uh, you know, if they comply with the requirements, the security requirements of the government, if they're really moving toward a, you know, accommodating this type of competition. Uh, I think that, you know, we could say that it's really about national security. I think, on the other hand, we may find that the, you know, the, the goalpost keeps changing um, and that, uh, you know, it's just not going to be uh, something that the Chinese government is really interested in landing on a, uh, a compromise with some of the other uh, governments and, and data protection regimes. and. You know, if, if they just remain intransitive, and uh, it, it shows to me uh, that overall the effect of the policy might, in the first place, have been traditional industrial policy. Um, you know, the science, technology, um, you know, development-driven um, motivations, uh, just with more cybersecurity tacked on uh, at the end. So um, that's what I've got for now, and, and thanks so much. So um, we have another uh, two presentations to go. Uh, perhaps someone would like to actually pose a question to Graham because I think it, in the absence of time, Ming uh, doesn't have much sense, uh, or we can leave him with questions. Um, anyone who would like to raise something there? Yeah, yeah please. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, under the Obama administration, we saw the uh, strategic economic dialogue being the principal driver between the United States and China on cybersecurity policy, uh, but that largely fell apart uh, with Homeland Security taking an increased role on having that dialogue with China that eventually led to the uh, non-commercial happiness agreement with China. Uh, yet we see under the first phase of Trump's presidency sorry. that they have, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, how's that? Uh, under the Trump presidency, we have seen almost the exact same thing as the strategic economic dialogue reformed 
uh, with state, treasury, and China. Do you see that there is a meaningful difference under this iteration of a strategic economic dialogue from the previous one? And if there is, have there been lessons learned from that uh, security cooperation between Homeland Security and the Ministry of Public Security within the cybersecurity framework? That's a big question. Yeah, uh, let's see, is this working? Um, thank you, that's a good question. It, it is a big question and it's one I don't think we know the answer completely yet. Um, as you mentioned, the strategic and economic dialogue was sort of taken apart and then put back together as this four-pronged uh, thing that they uh, announced, the two presidents announced in April uh, in Florida. Um, and finally, the fourth uh, meeting was the one on, I think it's called Law Enforcement and Cybersecurity. Is that right? A little, my brain's a little fried. I, I think that's what they call it. But what it consists of is uh, from, from what we got in readouts and what some people in Washington told me, um, you know, this was really mostly about, uh, it, it, it's sort of a re-implementation of a different thing that was, that came out of the 2015 uh, agreement when they, when they agreed not to steal commercial secrets for commercial gain anymore. Um, they also said that we were going to start a high-level working group on cyber crime and related issues. Um, and also a, an experts group on cyber norms. Nobody knows what's happened to the norms group. Um, the cyber crime group seems to have morphed into this law enforcement dialogue. And meanwhile, uh, there was a joint liaison group on law enforcement cooperation between the two countries that seems also to have been folded into this. Um, so they talked a lot about <coughs> repatriating uh, people that the United States wants to deport. Uh, China had not been very cooperative in accepting uh, people who had final orders of removal uh, from this country. The US has not been totally cooperative in returning people that the Chinese government views as fugitives and, and sort of uh, you know, renegade officials who've run off with <coughs> ill-gotten gains. Um, the cyber stuff uh, it seems to have been fairly minimal. They had a reiteration of the earlier agreement, but I don't think there was much going on. Yeah. So, I'm presenting on Japanese industrial policy and cybersecurity. Um, the paper as it stands is at this moment more of a survey, but I'm going, the next step is sort of to get more of a causal story here, and so I'm going to talk about some of my initial ideas in terms of that so that I can get useful feedback on, well, also it makes a better presentation, but also that way I can get some useful feedback on that causal story before I go and start running on it. Um, when thinking about Japanese industrial policy, the first question I had was, how do we think about, I mean, how do we evaluate this, right? Like, is Japanese industrial policy working well or not working well? And this has a lot to do with what you think the goal is. Um, if you think of it in terms of advancing Japan's actual cybersecurity sector, the, you know, cybersecurity firms, not so well. Like, it, they haven't been doing that much. There isn't much of a Japanese cybersecurity sector. On the other hand, if you think of it as improving the terms of cyber sort of improving overall cybersecurity, right? Then it's actually pretty good. I mean, there are a lot of problems, but they've been getting better at it. Um, there really are, uh, particularly in terms of the infrastructure stuff and in terms of sort of IoT, in terms of automobiles, they've been doing a lot in, ter in terms of improving security for that. Um, they have really low incidences of malware and viruses. So in that respect, I think they've actually been doing a good job. And I'm sort of arguing that there's an, a connection here, which is that effectively part of the reason they haven't been doing such a good job of promoting their cybersecurity sector is because they actually have been taking it seriously as a security problem. They've been focused more on, and particularly their own focusing on uh, protecting their own economic security uh, to the degree that they don't have to worry so much about you know, coming up with their own antivirus software and things like that. Um, so, First, I'm going to talk about what their actual policy is, and then I'm going to talk about what I think are the sort of three drivers of that, uh, one of which is the nature of the market itself, sort of what the sector is looked like relative to one another. Uh, second, the policy-making structure. And third, uh, the fact that sort of American software and services for the Japanese, particularly for the Japanese government, represents a pretty good second-best alternative to making their own software. Um, 
So Japan's industrial policy. The first three of these are actually, uh, I'm copying off of sort of Andrew and Vinny's models. And they're sort of related to the ones you see in the American case. The fourth and fifth one, I think, are you see in Japan, but not so much in the US, at least from what I've read. Um, so procurement and licensing. So this is where, of course, the government uh, goes out and buys products uh, from sort of the Japanese market in, toward, in order to uh, give companies money that they can use to develop software. Um, they do have some sort of direct research and development funding. So you do have them setting up a lot of it for uh, particularly cryptography. Um, so you do see some of that. Um, and they have been particularly in 2016 uh, developing uh, government-wide procurement standards. So one of the big problems and one of the big complaints about cyber that cybersecurity companies in Japan have has been that there are sort of different standards for different parts of the government, and this makes it really hard for them to sell to the government as a whole. Um, and so there have been efforts now to make it so that it's a government-wide uh, standard. Um, on the other hand, spending on this is relatively low, really low compared to Singapore and South Korea. So Japan's, uh, this is a, as a percentage of GDP, I should say, uh, I, sh I would take these numbers with a grain of salt as well. I'm fairly certain Japan is reporting more or less all of its spending on cybersecurity. I'm less sure about the other three since they're, they tend to be more worried about sort of keeping military secrets than, the US, than Japan does. Um, so they may be doing more spending that they're not telling you about. Um, but roughly speaking, Japan's not spending as much on procurement as some other countries are. It's also not clear that Japan's procurement will go to Japanese cybersecurity companies, right? So even if it is buying more, it may just be buying more American products. Um, Public-private partnerships. This is again, so this, I mean, Japan obviously excels at in terms of having, this is, was in Vinny and Andrew's thing, the going to Silicon Valley or having Silicon Valley come to DC. In Japan, everything's in Tokyo, so I just sort of put it and collapse into one instead of having two different things. Um, but there is a lot of representation from private industry within government policymaking. Um, you have presidents of companies sort of sitting in the decision-making bodies. Uh, you have a lot of back and forth between bureaucrats and people sitting in the companies. So that's, uh, that they do a lot of. Um, the government's also very, very interested in promoting information sharing. We were talking earlier about how why companies don't like to share information because they're afraid it will affect their reputation. Uh, the government has really been pushing both sort of private information sharing groups and also uh, government information sharing groups. So there's a lot of effort on that. On the other hand, they're really, really bad at this idea of developing uh, private talent in the government. So we were talking earlier, for those of you who hear about the Israeli model, where people serve as part of the Israeli Defense Forces or the Israeli Army for a couple of years, get some experience doing cyber stuff, then go found companies. Maybe the companies fail. If that happens, they come back into government. Uh, that does not happen in Japan. Um, it does not happen in Japan for a couple reasons. One, the bureaucracy continues to favor generalists over specialists. Boy, do the specialists complain about that a lot, which I understand. Um, so if you were going into the government, you're better off not being a cybersecurity expert, but you know, someone who's able to deal with a lot of different things. Um, and then companies continue to sort of prefer getting people straight out of college, not people who've been in the government for a couple of years. And um, so there's not, as, as a result, there's not really this good sort of back and forth between government and private industry that you see in Israel. And even to some extent, if, if less, in the US. Um, regulatory power, a lot of what the Japanese government does falls under this category. Um, they release huge numbers of standards about all kinds of things. Um, that having been said, the standards are mainly voluntary. So it is a lot of sort of behind the scenes, like twisting arms and trying to get companies to follow these standards. Um, and they, there are some exceptions, right? So if you're uh, one of the critical infrastructure companies, then you actually have actual reporting standards that you have to report back to your own uh, responsible ministry in the government. If a cyber attack happens, but for the most part, it's all voluntary, and the government's just trying to sort of push these standards out. Um, tax and loan policy. So this is something I didn't see so much in the US case. I'm um, still sort of going into how much of this Japan is doing. Um, they do definitely have some efforts aimed at encouraging small and medium-sized 
enterprises to improve their cybersecurity. So they give you tax breaks if you buy new software or new equipment that will help improve your cybersecurity. Uh, there's some exempt tax exemptions for research into cybersecurity. Um, again, though, one thing to note is on all of these is that a lot of this really is about improving your own cybersecurity rather than necessarily making things better for the cybersecurity sector, right? So a lot of these sort of tax, uh, these tax deductions stuff go for buying cybersecurity, not for buying Japanese cybersecurity products, but simply for improving your own cybersecurity. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting in terms of what the Japanese government does that I don't really see in the US, although I suspect you do see if you look at, say, South Korea, um, is a lot more of this idea of promoting cybersecurity as a public good. The most interesting of these, although not the one with the most interesting photo, which I'll show in a minute, it was the Cyber Clean Center, which was actually run by three private or semi-private agencies, but funded by the government. And what this did was they it basically watched the Japanese internet for bots to see if there was a, if basically they had ways of tracing whether or not a particular IP was sending out uh, data that made it look like it was a bot or not. And they analyzed what type of bot that was. And what they would do is they would get the IP number, have sort of information about how to get rid of this bot on a web page somewhere, and they would tell the ISP, they wouldn't go directly to the end user, they would tell the ISP who was, was in charge of this particular IP address, hey, you've got this user, here's the IP address of them, they have this bot, send them this information about how to remove this bot. Um, and, that, and that was an extremely effective way of reducing the number of bots on sort of Japan's internet. Um, the similar efforts have been made sort of ad hoc by the police. So there was a really good example where the, there was similarly a, a set of malware that was sending out data to servers in Japan, uh, and the police took one over. Um, and what they did was then when you, they re the server received the information from the malware, they sent a message back to the computer saying, hey, you've got this malware, here's how you remove it. So that's a very interesting one. Um, there's a lot of efforts on public education in terms of getting people to take cybersecurity more seriously. Now, polls show that the Japanese still don't as much as one would like to, so this doesn't necessarily mean it's successful, but the government is trying really hard. Um, and this is one of my favorite ones here, which is, the, there is this is actually from a photo I took in Harajuku, uh, where they're doing a bunch of advertisements like uh, girls manga, romance manga, romance comics, and, uh, the guy saying here, such a weak password doesn't suit you. And they had a whole bunch of these about all different aspects of cybersecurity, which I just thought was great. Um, and then the last one is not surprisingly much like other countries, they're focusing a lot on sort of training and promoting a cybersecurity workforce. So there's a lot of money and a lot of effort going into that. Um, so not so much, again, this back and forth between government and the private industry that, as in the Israeli model, but a lot of setting up, you know, funding for schools, a lot of, equivalent to the Hack the Pentagon programs. They have things that are similar to that, hacking camps, that sort of thing. So what is driving this? Again, my argument here is that for the most part, these things are great. I mean, in particular, I think this public one, right, is great for improving cybersecurity, but not necessarily great for improving your cybersecurity sector, right? Because if the government is doing all these things for you, you're not gonna pay some private industry to, company to do it, right? Um, so again, the focus here really does seem to be on improving cybersecurity in general rather than the sector. And I would say that there are three reasons why this is happening. One is due to the nature of the market itself, and by, I should have put this a little better, in terms of the, the types of sectors that one sees in the government, not who's sort of doing the buying. Um, policy making structure has a big influence on this, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then this American software as a reasonable second best option. So, Andrew and Vinny very nicely uh, divide this types of firms into cybersecurity firms, which are those that work on cybersecurity directly, internet ne technology firms, which are operations and products that rely on cybersecurity, and internet adjacent firms, which do not fall within the information technology sector, but rely on network components. Um, basically, in terms of cybersecurity firms in Japan, there are almost none. I mean, the ones that are aren't big, the biggest by far that's located in Japan is Trend Micro, but as every Japanese government official I've talked to about it pointed out to me, it is not a Japanese company. It's founded by Taiwanese people. Um, and so that makes a big difference as to how much influence they have within the Japanese government, as 
is obvious by the fact that literally every bureaucrat pointed it out to me. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of these sort of internet technology and internet adjacent firms, right? Lots of companies are making products that go on the internet. Uh, there's the whole IoT sector, right? Automobiles, uh, there are the financial firms rely on this, the banks rely on the internet. Uh, they have a lot, you know, NEC, there are all kinds of companies that have something to do with the internet technology, but not, you know, producing cyber security necessarily. Um, and a couple of things about these companies make it, make it really hard for Japanese cybersecurity to get started. Uh, one of these things is these, comp these latter two types of firms, I put latter two firms, should have been latter two types of firms, I apologize. Uh, when you ask them their preferences, and I did not ask them their preferences, I read surveys that did, but I would have liked to have also asked them. Uh, when you ask them their preferences for what they're looking for in security software, what they want is the same type of security software everyone else is using, right? So they, they say, who else? They look out and say, what other companies that are like mine, are you, what are they using for security software? And that's the security software they want to use. Um, that, of course, just helps people with the first, that helps the US right, with its first mover advantage, or other countries with first mover advantage. They don't want to take a risk on these sort of unknown Japanese cybersecurity companies. They'd rather have the stuff that they know works. Um, oh, man, I'm talking, I have to speed up. Um, and, uh, the other thing that's interesting about their preferences is, unlike the US uh, instance where we heard you know, sort of Silicon Valley saying, back off, back off, let us do all the standards, the firms in Japan, and partly this is probably because they're not software companies, uh, really, really want the, U uh, the government to set standards. In fact, their biggest ask of the government is to give them a s specific set of things they need to do to ensure cybersecurity. Uh, the government, in the meantime, has no interest in giving that to them at all because they feel like then they'll do the bare minimum. So it's sort of an interesting difference between the U.S. Um, in terms of the policy-making structure, uh, the main thing to know about this, I'll skip over much of the explanation since I only have five minutes, uh, is that there are four important ministries. So it, it looks like, if you look at this giant thing here, that the center here is where the policy is being made. But the important thing to realize is that the center is entirely staffed by people from these four ministries, right? So they're the ones who are actually making the decisions. And they're mainly using these uh, other organizations as a place to hash out their differences. And in particular, the two that really are running things day to day, and we can talk, I can answer why if anyone's interested, are the Ministry of Economics, Industry, and Trade, and the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. Um, and Effectively, the short answer of why they dominate is they're just better at bureaucracy. Well, A, they teamed up, and B, they're better at bureaucracy. Um, and these guys mainly worry about cybersecurity in terms of threat to the Japanese economy, right? So they focus a lot on the threat to infrastructure. They focus a lot on improving cybersecurity of devices or of automobiles as a way to sort of improve Japan's brand, right? We've got the safest, you know, cars in the world in terms of cybersecurity. But they don't focus so much on the sort of antivirus stuff. Um, it's possible that has something to do with earlier failures to promote software. Um, I heard that at least from one person who was like, we tried to make our own Google and everything and that didn't work. So it could be that there's some sort of learning going on there that like, well, that, we were bad at that, so let's focus on the things we're better at. Um, but I would have to look a little bit more to know if that's a more general feeling or if that was just that one guy. Um, the last key factor here, I think, is the fact that for the government, right, we've already talked about Private industry is basically doesn't care at all where this is sourcing from. The government cares a little bit, and I think particularly the LDP cares, um, given the fact that they wrote into the basic law on cybersecurity a bunch of stuff about how there, sh there should be promotion of the Japanese cybersecurity sector. Um, but I think that uh, their preferences, and particularly the bureaucrats' preferences, are that, yes, that would be nice, Japanese software would be nice, but we need to worry more about just improving cybersecurity as a whole. Um, and in particular, I think that because while it's hard to improve proof preferences, every bureaucrat I talked gave me some version of, well, that would be nice, but here's why we can't do it. And the why we can't do it would change from bureaucrat to bureaucrat, but it was always sort of like, yes, that would be lovely, but uh, we can't. And I think that generally means that it's probably lower on their priority list. Um, why are they okay with this? One, they're already used to relying on the US for security matters, right? So it, Having to rely on the U.S. also for your cybersecurity is not that big of a stretch. Um, 
But I think that that alone doesn't explain it, right? Because there have been efforts, for example, for them to promote their own space industry, right? Even though they could, in theory, rely on the US for that. I think part of it, too, is just this, there's not really a supply issue when it comes to cybersecurity, right? Even if you trust the US, right? The US, there are only so many space launches you can do at a year. There are only so many satellites you can put up. So even if you trust the US, the US, of course, is going to put its own interests above yours, right? And so you have a reason for wanting then to have your own independent space agency. On the other hand, you can buy antivirus software, right? Like, there's not a limited amount of antivirus software out there, right? So it's not that hard. You don't really have to worry about the US not supplying that to you or putting its own interests above your own in that case. So I think for a lot of that sort of more general thing, they, they're like, eh, that's a pretty good second best option. And for now, we want to worry more about sort of actually getting our security up and less about sort of promoting the cybersecurity sector. And that's it. Uh, so I think this is a really fascinating case. I think this is the right guy to figure it out. Um, I really think uh, Ben did a great job of kind of laying out the, um, the main storyline about Japanese cybersecurity policy. So I'm basically not going to critique anything that he did, but go straight to kind of next steps. Like what could we go, how could we go beyond this? Um, and basically, I want to make two simple comments, and maybe I'll extrapolate on each of them, which is that I think going forward, he would benefit a lot from situating this case both in a cross-sectoral and a cross-national context, right? In other words, thinking hard about what is different between this sector and other sectors within Japan, and then what is different between Japanese cybersecurity policy and cybersecurity policy in other countries. Obviously, for the latter, the other papers by your colleagues here are going to be enormously helpful. But let me try to be a little bit clearer about what I mean. Um, in terms of the cross-sectoral comparison, right, I think it's useful to kind of separate out two things, right? What is distinctive about this sector that would be distinctive anywhere, right? Like the generic features of this, right, sector. And then what are the distinctive features of, that are just distinctive only in Japan, right? Um, and so like what kinds of things might we be thinking about? I, I can think of at least three, right? One is um, the market structure. Two is the government policy structure. I mean, these are already in your paper, but I'm just kind of pushing this for, hopefully forward. Um, and the third is what are the nature of the policy networks that, that bridge the two, right? Um, and so if we kind of went down one, two, three, both generic features and then Japanese specific features, you could say, okay, industry structure. Unfortunately, I don't know this sector well enough to kind of fill in all the boxes, but I think you would think about things like firm size concentration, uh, capital intensive versus labor intensive, what kind of skill base is required for this business, and, what, and, and some of those things would be true, right, anywhere, right? And then what are the distinctive features about the Japanese case, right? You might say, well, for example, you might say generically it's conducive to small firms, but um, Japan is an exception along whatever lines. Second would be the government structure. And there again, you might say generically, well, in every country, you're going to have this tension between the military um, and the industrial side. And that's going to be true. That's just kind of the, the, the nature of the beast, right? But it's going to play out in very different ways in each country, right? Um, and then third would be um, the networks, and I'm just going to kind of guess here again, but I would say a, a couple of probably distinctive features of this sector are that it's relatively new, right, as a kind of a agreed upon issue, right? Um, and it's highly interpenetrated with a lot of different other areas, right? I mean, because cyber security connects to military, it connects to domestic security, it connects to IT policy, and it connects to social regulation, kind of at a minimum, right? Um, and so if you're thinking about, like, in terms of policy networks, um, I would guess that the policy network in, that's distinctive to cybersecurity would tend to be small, right? Um, and that it would be very highly interpenetrated with all of these other, right, closely related areas, right? And so that, again, might be true in general, but that, that, that story might play itself out in the Japanese case in a very distinctive way, and you would have a lot to say about that. Um, so on to the cross-national. And there it's just a matter of kind of giving your story more kind of Japanese political economy context. And there's already hints of it there, so I can, you know, I can already see this, this happening. Um, uh, and 
I know the audience doesn't want to hear a full diatribe on this, so I'm just going to make a couple <laughs> short points on that. Um, first would be um, cybersecurity clearly is an area that overlaps jurisdictions, as I was saying. Now, the, the, the Japanese history on this is when there's a, a new sector that emerges that where the jurisdiction is not clearly in the hands of one ministry, you get a turf battle. That's, that's your basic pattern. And the turf battles all include METI or MITI, METI or METI, depending on what time you're talking about, because METI has very little jurisdiction of its own, um, but it has some right to basically get into everybody else's business, um, and so you have this series of turf wars. Um, the interesting story is that, the, that now, you know, 2017, there's kind of an update to that, right, which you very nicely pointed out, which is that the Japanese political system has been centralizing with greater power in the prime minister's office and in the cabinet office. And so you might say, well, the turf battles are over, the prime minister is running the country and the cabinet is running the country. The truth is more interesting than that, which is that the turf battles are now playing out inside the cabinet office, right? Because the staff of the cabinet office come from all the different ministries. Um, and so it's kind of turf wars too, right? Uh, but it's very different, but it does, I think, explain a lot of what's going on in your case. Um, without going into the details, I think that, that METI is the, is, is the most penetrated into the cabinet office, and that explains why METI is the, is the most powerful player for the moment, right, in this story. The other thing about Japanese history, which is, obvi you know, which is obvious but worth stating, is that the post-war period, there, the focus was on economic growth, not military power. And that wasn't just a policy, it was institutionalized in the structure of the Japanese government with a kind of a, a deliberately weak defense agency um, that really had to um, defer to the Ministry of Finance on defense procurement and to the uh, to METI, METI now METI on issues of uh, defense technology, right, and defense industrial base, right? And so again, we're getting an old story with a new version, right? Because now we do have a Ministry of Defense. It's been upgraded. Um, but I would argue that that legacy the, is still probably pretty powerfully coloring your story because the fact that METI had this kind of outsized role in promoting the defense industry and defense technology um, still affects how Japan uh, addresses this new sector of cybersecurity. That's all. Thank you very much. That was, that was really helpful. <laughs> Good, let's see. Um, other questions? Yes, please. Uh, well, just some uh, random comments. Uh, I, I've been working in cybersecurity mostly in the corporate sector, but it interacts obviously with the government sector. Um, on the government side, uh, I've been struck by the uh, reliance of the Japanese and the government in particular on NIST, National mm. Institute of Science and Technology, uh, for guidelines about how to proceed. And I think that's worth uh, some exploration. Um, I've also been looking at uh, NRI, Nomura Research Institute, which provides major cybersecurity services. And I think we need to distinguish between products and services. They may be providing a lot of US products, but uh, services are a critical element here, and uh, we should get confused uh, that it's all, it's all about product. Services are critical for implementation, for showing companies how to, how to use these things and how to implement properly. Um, <laughs> NRI has a pretty active uh, cybersecurity activity. They recently completed a survey of US and Japanese cybersecurity uh, practices, and uh, I interviewed the designer of that study, actually. Um, so uh, that's, their role is, uh, uh, I, I don't think you can just say there's nothing going on in terms of, of cybersecurity companies uh, without thinking about a company like that. And, and again, keeping in mind that, you know, if there's the one place where you want cyber security, it's in your financial institutions. Uh, that's where uh, some of the best people in the United States are. And uh, it's critical that uh, 
any advanced society have really incredibly strong cybersecurity. Tell that to, uh, I think we had one more. Oh, I, I just one last comment. One last comment. Uh, on the Internet of Things, IoT, that I think the Japanese are struggling with. Uh, I'm not as optimistic as you suggest. I mean, IoT is critical to cybersecurity because it dramatically explodes the attack vectors. Uh, and getting that under control is a Herculean task. The Japanese, uh, like a lot of people, don't have, uh, they're pushing the government, the corporate sector is pushing the government to try to get some kind of standards. Um, and how that plays out, I think, is worth pursuing. Sorry to take so much time. Thank you. Um, yes, please. So I work for IBE dash JETR or E IBE dash J E T R O Jetro. Uh -huh. Which is right under Meg, which is a company underneath Meg. And I've been working there for 30 years. And so I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I was thinking about two comments that I have to make here. And so in Japan, one of the problems that people are dealing with is uh, language. They don't really understand English. They only speak Japanese, you know. And so if what happens if I'm going off your idea, maybe an option would be getting some software from America or American software, but. Um, you know, all of that stuff is written in English. Mm. All the software is written in English. And it's hard for the Japanese people to uh, to kind of understand that. And it actually happened a few weeks ago. Microsoft released a new operating system and gave it to, gave a free version, you know, out. And some people downloaded it and tried to install it on the computer. And if the computer had that Norton antivirus software on it, the next thing that happened was uh, the whole screen went blue. <laughs> and the computer was just stopped. They just froze up. So a lot of people are saying, like, what are we supposed to do here? And Norton, Norton apparently was late on their patch or their update. And so, if they were able, they were they provided that information in English, but they weren't able to provide that information in Japanese. So a lot of people just didn't know what was happening, and they also told all other people not to download that product because this is going to happen. So that was something that happened in Japan, and that's something that happens often. It's not. It actually happens a lot in Asia. It's not a problem just um, for Japan. And the question that we that we think of is, should our government be responsible for translating the the English into Japanese so that the citizens can understand it? It's, it's a question that come up. But if you look at it in historical terms, companies like Microsoft or companies like Apple, they usually do the translating of their products themselves, and they. Uh, Sorry, give me one second. Oh, so the government doesn't subsidize, subsidize Microsoft or Apple in order to translate from English into another language. So they are just kind of do that. So when you're saying so when you're talking about these software for these companies and if the government should be subsidizing it. All right, give me one second, guys. I'm having a hard time. So Microsoft and Apple develop their products in English first, and then they'll translate it in other languages. And the government doesn't 
pay for that or it doesn't subsidize that at all. So if we're talking about software dealing with cybersecurity, don't you think the government should be sponsoring that mm -hmm. and should be should have a role in that? And that's just uh, my two cents. Right. Um, but do you, perhaps do you actually perhaps want to answer? Because I think this comes back also to problems that uh, have been addressed in the past, probably partially in the uh, software development. Uh, in terms of the translation issue? Yeah. Uh, boy, should, so the question is, should government sponsor it? Uh, I mean, I, I can certainly see an argument for it, right? um, and I can. I I would imagine the Japanese government would be. I mean, again, I'm not in the Japanese government, but I would imagine they would be more open to that than the United States government would be, since I think the U.S. usually doesn't like to do that kind of thing. Um, but it's a really good question. I mean, you can. I can definitely see an argument for why, particularly if, if you are worried about these kinds of problems cropping up, um, the government should take a role in that. On the other hand, of course. Uh, you know, there's the other argument, which is how, how much responsibility the government, do the companies themselves bear, right? I mean, this, this, this then, you know, they'll certainly take advantage of, at, at some point you have to wonder whether they're just going to take advantage of making everything a cybersecurity issue so the government will pay them to do it, right? So there's always that trade-off. By the way, I have observed that uh, France, as a government, takes a lot of effort to make sure that they produce uh, their information in French and in English. <laughs> but this has to do more about the products and the activities that are happening around development. Right? Okay, let's uh, move to um, the final part for uh, this part of, the, of our conference, which is the presentation on uh, Taiwan, which uh, Chin Yuan uh, will do. And uh, then the discussant will be Nagi Sha. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Shini Huang from Taiwan. Uh, yes, today I'm presenting the Taiwan case. Uh, and I do realize I'm the last one presenting, so I think I have all the reason to make it short and <laughs> get it done soon. Um, so, to actually, to begin, I want to draw my conclusion for my, my, my paper is that the, um, the government policy approach in Taiwan is a very top-down approach, right? So it's like uh, um, managed by the government and then push and carry out a lot of uh, program plans and action plans. Uh, so to begin, I want to say some like uh, the, the, the drives of why government want to do this. So uh, in, the, in the action plan, it mentions uh, because of the growing threat of these global cyber attacks, and then our complex, uh, complex political situation with mainland China. Um, our gov the current government actually want to strengthen our defense industry. So um, they have this uh, new defense policy uh, focused on three targeting <coughs> Fields and cybersecurity is one of it, in, uh, together with aerospace and missile. So you can already uh, expect the government is going to put in some effort and some budget, like developing these three areas. So this is our uh, President Tsai uh, giving a speech at uh, the annual hacker conference in Taiwan in. July 2016, s stating that she thinks uh, cybersecurity is a matter of national security, uh, so the government is going to promote it. And so after one year following uh, President's speech, the, the Ministry of National Defense also responding to the President's uh, statement that they launched this new military command and for cybersecurity, so so uh, in so they, they they are going to recruit new talents and new militaries for cybersecurity, but so far we haven't seen because it's so new and we haven't seen any um, following policy actions like uh, responding to this new command. And then where are the resource the, the budget comes from? Like because I checked our defense budget this year, it's not really increasing. So like, yeah, there's a new command, but look, people are wondering where can they get the budget and what are they gonna do with this new command? But yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a it's a new topic in Taiwan right now for the government, and so um, I later gonna introduce our cybersecurity policy in the past fifteen years. You can see uh, maybe it's too small for people to see it, but in the past ten years, so you can see like the government uh, already putting some effort to. To, to develop these cybersecurity protections and policies. And in the first 10 years, uh, they focus most on the readiness of government's infrastructure and protection. Uh, so uh, they, they establish uh, National Information and Community Security Task Force, and they also force every minister, uh, every ministry to appoint the Chief Information Security Officer in 2005. So you can see like they try to um, do a lot of government procurement in the first 10 years to establish these protection systems to, and the infrastructure. Um, and the later two phases of the national program focus, start to focus more on industrial policy. Uh, and then uh, t from, from, from last year, from 2016, uh, because you can you can see every every uh, there are four phases of national programs in the past fifteen years, and so every new government has a new program, and then so from two thousand sixteen there is a new draft of the national security uh, national plan, and the government tries to uh, have a, a base law for uh, information security management. So, uh, which I would describe later. Uh, this is already sent to legislature in 2016, and then um, the new government program is going to carry out in the next four years as well. So, uh, if so, so since government already putting a lot of effort in the past 15 years, I was wondering, you know, is are uh, were they effective? Like, what kind of if uh, impact we already have? So I tried to look into some data uh, to see if um, the past policies already create some awareness for the government sectors and the private sectors to increase their um, cybersecurity spending. And so uh, according to this national statistics, it's like uh, from 2005 to 2010, the uh, cybersecurity spending doesn't, uh, did, did not increase for public sectors and public business organizations. But yeah, it's increasing for the pub, uh, private sectors. But if we, if, if we look at the percentage of budget for cybersecurity, then you can see the trend are level. So <laughs> actually, um, based on the data, they didn't really increase that much spending for cybersecurity in Taiwan given those effort in policy making and, and, and the budget they put in to, 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 to do so. And unfortunately, my data ends in 2010 because the, the survey just continued in 2010. So I don't have, uh, in 2011, so I couldn't have data uh, later on for current, for, for recent years. Um, it would be great to, to, to see because later they have more uh, action plans for industry boost and for development uh, in the industry. So I, I, I think it will be great to see if those efforts really actually take place. Oh, and then, <clears throat> uh, so this paper, the, the, the majority of this paper will focus on the very late last policy uh, program for the cybersecurity in Taiwan. Um, there are three goals in the latest one, which uh, plan to take action the next four years. The first one is, of course, like other uh, states, that they want to strengthen the national security by, by cybersecurity. And the second one is to increase market demand. Uh, and then so they can stimulate the industry, the com public companies to involve in this, com in, in this in new, new markets. And then the third one is to increase more human capital in the cybersecurity industry. So the three goals are pretty similar like other states. 
And today, my, my presentation will focus mostly on the second goal, which is uh, what are the government actions and involvement in building the industry? And so you can see this, um, like this framework shows, <clears throat> the goal is to increase industry innovation and uh, the, the markets, so, and, uh, and also the demands of the market. So you can, um, based on the national plan, the, go the government, especially the major authority, which is the Department of Cybersecurity in Taiwan, is responsible for making a new act passed, which is uh, Information and Communication Security Management Act. So if this act can be passed, then uh, they are hoping this new law will increase demand markets, including defense market, government market, the critical information, uh, the critical infrastructure market, and the enterprise market. And so if there are more demands in the market, they're hoping the industry will react to it <laughs> and come up with more killer applications, newer, uh, uh, better service and products in, uh, in those areas like the big data analysis area, the risk management area, the surveillance analysis area, or like the weak point check areas, which they think could be the niche areas for Taiwanese companies because we cannot compete with those big um, like integration service in companies in f foreign countries. And so they're hoping they can develop those, uh, uh, they can develop technology in those areas. And uh, there will be um, technologies from the government research institutes <coughs> and uh, uh, universities. So you can see um, this model is very similar to many previous industrial policies in Taiwan, like uh, the, the textile industry, like the famous semiconductor industry in Taiwan, that we have a very clear division of labor between state and industry. Uh, like the literature mentioned that always leading, it was always led by the government sponsored research institute that they they, they learn foreign technologies and then they absorb it and they may transfer or sell to uh, local co companies. And later they will work together to develop more advanced improvement of the technology and then have this back and forth uh, relationship and then co-evolve in the industry. Um, so you can see like a very similar model like before, and so it's very government-led and government-dominating. So although they, they, they have the hope that because the increased demand that the, the, the industry later will develop its own in-house R&D, but if you look at the overall uh, framework, it's just like before actually. Uh, so. So to, to talk more about this Information and Communication Security Management Act, it's still a draft, and uh, it's already sent to the legislature to negotiate and discuss in October 2016, and hoping can get passed the end of the year or next year. So um, it's based, if you look into this act closely, it's, uh, it's, it's all about how to regulate information sharing and management across different organizations. So it's a, it's a very uh, detailed regulatory law for, for information sharing. And then organization under this regulatory policy includes basically all of the organizations in Taiwan, includes public agencies, public business, critical infrastructure organizations, uh, quasi-government organization and all other non-government sectors. Although uh, uh, the, all the public and quasi-public organizations are mandatory to report to the authorities with any uh, cybersecurity threats and information and the non-government sectors are voluntary to report. Um, but um, the criticism of this act are many actually right now 
It's like uh, people have doubts that whether government can monitor, can, can effectively monitor those, those agencies, and then how can they manage the huge amount of cost of uh, administration and uh, <laughs> like uh, how can they do it in this PA problems, principal agent problem? Okay, thank you. And then so uh, will, and then will private sector cooperate? like reporting to the authorities. But uh, in this act, actually, although um, private companies are, uh, is not man man mandated to report to the authority, but if something went wrong, then the government, then, then they cannot refuse the government to have an inspection. So people are afraid that it's giving government too much power in like a, like a, uh, 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 surveillance them, that kind of thing. So there are a lot of uh, criticisms in this. And so uh, an overlook of the cybersecurity industry in Taiwan, uh, it's like increasing um, in the market size. Uh, so we focus on like the four major areas, uh, mostly in the, in the risk management areas. But um, Government mentioned that uh, many of the domestic firms tend to be very small. So you can see we have only one company is more than 1,000 employees, which is the Trend Micro. And however, its headquarters is in Japan and uh, its public listing in Japan and in the US, but not in Taiwan. So interestingly, we don't know whether this can be considered as a Taiwanese firm. And then 75% of the companies are less, are very small, are less than 50 employees. So, um, yeah, so, so this is basically the reason why government think, oh, there is a market failure and government need to step in shipping and try to, um, to boost uh, the four targeting markets they aim to boost. Yeah, so like the government market, the enterprise market, the critical infrastructure market, and then defense market, and then those are the policy tools they propose they want to use. Um, like the government procurement, uh, of course limited to domestic firms, and uh, uh, some tax, tax policy for, for small, medium-sized companies, subsidies, uh, for like grants to, 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 to have like R&D projects, um, or some new industrial part that you know, they want to copy the success experience from the Xinzhu experience uh, and all other uh, similar traditional intervention uh, like before. So uh, like draw from literature and then also discussion from the Professor Ogur's discussion this morning. Yeah, so we also think there will be problems relating to those uh, policy intervention they use right now. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, for example, for the enterprise market, it could have the crowd out effect, like uh, the company simply doesn't want to invest, even though the government shipping. Um, so it will provide no very little motives for local com company to have competition if you give too much protection to them and those kind of things. So I think uh, because I don't have enough time, I'm going to uh, just uh, summarize. Because I'm a policy scholar myself, so I want to push forward discussion to not just um, stating out the problems, uh, the, 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 the intervention governments involved, but also what could be the, um, the afterwards effect after those policies being made or, or, or announced. So one, one problem is right now the leading authority is Department uh, of Cybersecurity and they are working, they are eager to pass this new, new law, this act, right? This um, management act. Um, but I, I was wondering, because uh, implementing the policy is different from making the policy. So in, when you make the policy, you have a lot of ideals and then I think like uh, imaginations. But when, you, when, when it comes to implementing the, the policy, it can, especially uh, it involves like interagency collaboration and then each one need to 
uh, take one, one part of the job and then sometimes even need to work together. And it can be very difficult for government agencies to work together. So later, once they start implementing the policy, uh, can the Department of Cybersecurity still be the leading authority? Because they are not a ministry yet. They are just a small unit under the, the, the cabinet. So it's like uh, only 20 people <laughs> in this office. So can they be the leading authority doing this? Uh, also, what could be the better policy intervention to solve market failure, like government mentioned, that they need to chip in? Um, I think based on my uh, observation and uh, study in this field, I think to still the government using the traditional policy tools, and those policy tools are proven are proved to be less effective or no effect at all. So why still using the those those tools? Um, so can we think of new tools like a public like investing approach but with risk sharing conditions or, or other things or even decrease the level of government intervention? However this is open question to, to many of us, that um, we really need to, I think it's in my, my recommendation for this, this paper as well, like we really need to carefully evaluate those policy intervention. Like, so we're not making the same mistakes or keep doing the same thing but have no effect at all. Um, and then also, who should be the industry leader? This will be my last point. That, uh, uh, should the government be the leader or the, the government sponsor uh, research institute the, the leader like uh, we always did or we let a big uh, telecommunication company like uh, be like this anchor tenant and then leading the whole supply chain in the industry right so they because he may have the resource and then the network to, to connect everyone or um, we should let all the small and medium-sized firms um, ally with each other and then group an alliance. Um, so find the niche market for Taiwan because we cannot compete with those big foreign companies. So yes, to summarize, the top-down approach and government policy is very uh, regulatory oriented and hoping this new act uh, can stimulate the market. And however, it's like one industry policy fits all, so it's pretty past dependency. Uh, political influence could shape the policy as well that uh, yeah, different, different actors want to influence uh, who to get the, the resources. So yeah, um, that's it. I think I will stop here, and then thank you for listening. Thank you. So uh, now you will uh, now uh, provide comments. Um, you know, I think it's all right if you overrun a little bit of time. Okay, uh, it's very nice to be here. And I will kind of, well actually Xinyi's paper is nicely uh, summarized and point out the critical issues that involved in the uh, cybersecurity industrial policy in Taiwan and the act, we call it information and Communication Security Management Act is currently still under legislation process. And so I will kind of echo and extend Xinyi's point about this act. And first, first of all, I would like to say that, well, actually the act is inherited, ha, is inherited in the uh, uh, risk management factors. For example, in the act, uh, we regulate the public agencies to be uh, supervised or the private agency, private companies, for example, those critical infrastructure enterprises to be prepared, well prepared and prevented and preventing the, the, the cybersecurity incidents. For example, they have to regularly uh, submit the auditing and simulation and decision and analysis of data and in a regular basis. This is one thing, it's like a preparation phase. And the second phase, we have the response and reporting mechanism which require these, uh, those agents, those organizations to be regulated to have some immediate and responses 
when the incident, when the cyber attacks happen. And also, we regulate some uh, protocols and SOPs to, for the damage control for the, the cybersecurity incidents. And then, at, at the last stage, after the cyber attacks happens, they were regulated for some diagnosis and recovery and improvement. improvement. For example, uh, we require them to do some digital forensics to trace back the sources and the problems and, and the, the holes that were attacked. And of course, we also uh, require the recovery and feedback for the improvement. So actually, the, the, this previous regulation requirements follow risk management and sort of the PDCA stages is now the, the, the main things in the draft here. But I must think that the, the situation <coughs> is Taiwan is kind of a leaning towards the business size because as in the government, we have a very serious lack of IT talents and professions in the, in the public agencies. So that even the government is leading the legislation and the regulation in the cybersecurity, we depend on the business or industries to provide the, the services, the cybersecurity services. And it's not just the software, as we said, that the uh, Kaspersky or, or, or McPhee, it's even some uh, services is more customized or locally uh, demanded. It's even like the, the language interpretation problems. So, so it's, it's more like the, the customized issue or critical or, or cybersecurity products and services. So for summaries, um, it's like that we have this kind of policy instruments. The first thing is, that, as I said, the regulating the cybersecurity center and SOP. And the second thing, we have some mandatory reporting mechanism here. And of course, we have some information and experience sharing for the, the, the cybersecurity incidents. And of course, we have awards and punishment upon the compliance of the regulation. And then, actually, strictly speaking, we don't have still in Taiwan, we don't have still some direct investment or funding through the, the cybersecurity industry. But we do hope this regulation induce the procurement of the public, of the uh, cybersecurity products and services. And we do hope that we have more R&D investment and talents and business and industrial developments under these regulations. And uh, Xinyi and I are in the domain and in the fields of pu public administration and policy. So ac actually we'd like to propose a framework like this one. Uh, it's more like Okay. okay, it's more like the multi-stakeholder framework for decision and implementation here. So it's not just the international level. And we propose to deep down, it's not international, it's not regional, it's not even in a country level. We propose to deep down one level and to observe the stakeholder and the players within the country. And we have this kind of four players in the country. First thing is like those private uh, enterprises or public organizations to be regulated. This is first player or first category of player. And the second player is the for-profit or non-profit organization that or industries that can provide the cybersecurity products and services. That's the second player. And the third player, of course, is the social sectors. It's like a civil society organizations and individual citizens that are concerned about uh, the cybersecurity issues. And then the, the, the last one, of course, is the uh, cybersecurity policy authorities. And when we think about how the, the cybersecurity policy is really, uh, is, re is really working within the country, then for these four players, we have to also consider the three types of the criteria when they decide, when they do decision making and implement for those policies. The first one, we call it positive outcome. That's the expected benefit that we hope the policy can work. And the second one is called potential risk or negative outcome that, I mean, accompanying the, the, the policy. And of course, we have some cost investment or prerequisites if we would like to attain the benefit and to avoid the risk. So for example, if we look down one level of the players here, and we will find that uh, for those regulated organizations, of course, if they comply with the regulation, 
they may get better cybersecurity, and then of course it's helpful for their performance or competitiveness if the cybersecurity is good enough. But for this uh, for profit or, or the, the service provider, cybersecurity service provider, and of course it's helpful for their performance and competitiveness. And the investment here is also for their uh, technical levels to going up here. And then for the civil society organizations, their reputation, and they can raise the awareness from the society about the cybersecurity issues. But we do have some risk here for the players. And for example, and for those organizations to be regulated, they're concerned about inadequate regulatory power and concern about the, the invasion of individual freedoms that come from the regulation or over-regulation. And for those, the, the, uh, the service providers, actually they most concerned about the risk aversion from the government part, which means uh, although we talk about the PPP, the public-private partnerships, but actually the public agency sometimes, in some cases, they evade or evade their responsibilities. So that leaves the, the private partners to be accountable for any instance here. And of course, we have crowding out effect, which means that the private companies do not invest and rely overly upon the public expenditures. And then we have costs here, and we have clear uh, specification. And as I said, uh, public agency are lack of talents and the, the, the procurement systems in the government is not flexible enough to procure the cybersecurity services. So I guess this is all I have to talk about here. And we would propose that this kind of framework involving the individual players within the industrial policies must be considered or otherwise, we, it's, it's kind of hard to collect the empirical data after these policies are implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the so, uh, a word that I think I have heard in all of the uh, sessions is uh, PPP, uh, public partnership, which is an interesting one to consider from the perspective of convergence and divergence, because it may have both built in at the same time. But uh, are these PPPs actually existing? this kind of PPP approach, or are, are the examples of that present so that you know this will indeed uh, happen? Uh, This PPP model has not yet full. Uh, but I think that Professor Xiao provides a very nice uh, framework to, to look into like a future, future uh, results. Like if we see, like uh, if this app actually gonna be enacted, like this the end of the year or next year, then we can see if, um, this partnership with private and public organization is going to have the benefit they propose it, and also what could be the risk and then the cost. So it could be a nice, like uh, from like with, uh, scientific or the scholar perspective, how can we uh, evaluate the, the PPP relationship, the PPP model? <laughs> well, it's not actually happening right now in Taiwan, but we have this kind of framework. And actually, the regulation under uh, legislation is, is to promote this PPP happening. But as far as we can observe at this point, uh, the government procurement system in Taiwan is kind of is not flexible enough to promote the, the public-private partnership within. The, the domain of cybersecurity. For example, the, most of the specification is provided by government, but ironically, the government do not clear, um, is not clear enough for how the industry deal with the cybersecurity issues concerning the technical or the managerial issues here. So it's, it's not developing the, the partnership, but, but we hope we can have that.
for the questions. I find this personally a very interesting case because uh, I'm always thinking of one country, two systems. Uh, and whether this is, uh, so you've got a number of uh, companies that are extremely large uh, suppliers to, for example, Apple and others, and that are actually based both in Taiwan and in China. And uh, if uh, I'm wondering whether China is pursuing an one world, several systems type of approach, and Taiwan uh, is confronted with a two country, a one country, two systems approach. So if a large company of this nature is in getting involved in cybersecurity, and they will, because I think they are also interested in this uh, from both the component level as well as integrated systems. How would they fit in a picture like this? Or an international company. Exactly. International company. International Taiwanese company. Yeah. Um, so this one. Uh, so so I want to get back to my point of my my study. That um, I think my my personal conclusion to the government intervention is um, we have too too many intervention in the cybersecurity industry. That is probably. Uh, increasing the competition of the industry, that it's like protect domestic industry too much. So you are not really encouraging foreign investment. And also, uh, you are actually um, uh, like a, like a make those international company away, right? You keep them away from, from participating yeah. the, 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 the market. So, um, and also, with the impose of this new act, then if the private company wants to, you know, doesn't want to be investigated, right, or respond to the government's uh, uh, the new new regulation, they they probably will go away. So that's what I think. But what could be the the side effect of this new arrangement in regulatory policy? Yeah. 